Um, good morning, afternoon and evening to all of you in attendance today, uh, whether in person or online. Um, just thank you for attending. Um, the, the, just to, to remind everyone of uh, what the IDP is, so the International Dunhuang Project, um, is an international network connecting partner institutions um, that have in their custodianship items from the Eastern Silk Road. And since, since its establishment in the 1990s, the IDP has focused its efforts on the long-term preservation of these collections and also on making them more widely accessible by cataloging, conserving and digitizing them so that all the related metadata and images can be made available online. So embracing this sharing vision um, and spirit of collaboration, the Lotus Sutra Manuscripts Conservation and Digitization Project started at the British Library in 2017. And as a result of this multi-year initiative, 793 manuscripts uh, in Chinese of uh, the Lotus Sutra what that were found in Cave 17 at Dunhuang have now been conserved, digitized, and high quality images have been uploaded on the IDP platform. So the Lotus Sutra project has grown from strength to strength over the past few years. It has been an epic journey for all of us, uh, one that has been rich in lessons and that has revealed um, the huge potential for such projects to unlock the collections in truly innovative ways. And you will see through the, the presentations that, is, that applies to the way that set up workflows um, for large scale conservation and digitization projects, to the conservation methods and approaches that have been used, but also to imaging and pushing the boundaries of you know, multi-spectral imaging, but also involving uh, digital humanities and so on. I mean, there's a long list and we've benefited uh, along the way greatly from the support and input of many colleagues across the library. Uh, they'll know who they are, but thank you to all of them and to the team. So importantly, the members of the Lotus Sutra project team have gained invaluable expertise in their respected fields and honed unparalleled skills, technical skills. So um, it is really for me a great honor to, to be chairing this panel. Um, and it's also a very exciting opportunity to celebrate their achievements and to share their findings today. So please, for a start with Tan Wang Ward, or Wang Tan, the project manager. So, is my slide up? I realize I forgot your intro. <laughs> You can do it. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot the in official intro, which is very bad form for the panel chair. So <laughs> Tan is the project manager for the Lotus Sutra Manuscript Conservation and Digitization Project. And before starting uh, the role in 2018, she worked at the British Library already in the Culture and Learning Department on a DCMS-funded uh, collaborative exhibitions and knowledge exchange program with institutions uh, across China. So she also a BA in art history and theory from CAFA, Central Academic for, of Fine Arts in Beijing, and an MA in Global Arts from Goldsmiths University. She's also worked in a range of curatorial and editorial roles in institutions such as the National Art Museum in China and OCT Contemporary Art Terminal and produced experimental theatres for art festival. Now, the floor is yours again. <laughs> So good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, it's very special and rewarding for us to be accompanied by you to celebrate the successful completion of the Lotus Sutra Manuscripts Digitization Project. It has been truly wonderful to hear so many distinguished speakers talking about the Lotus Sutra and to hear the... Um, okay. Can I just try it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the intriguing questions by audience members here and online. Um, it is really in your passion for the Lotus Sutra and Dunhuang studies that we start to appreciate the meaning of wo our work in the past few years. Um, so the purpose of my presentation was to give you an overview of how we delivered the Lotus Sutra project, um, what's special about the project, how we um, improved our practices and processes over time. Um, alongside this, I hope to show you uh, as many images as possible. 
um, because this is the fruits of our um, project. Um, and okay, so, so the scope of the project, uh, as Melody has mentioned, that there are uh, um, 793 items included on the project. The majority are Lotus Sutra Chinese manuscripts. Uh, it's slightly richer than just Lotus Sutra, which I will show you in um, with some items later. And the shelf marks for these items have all been included uh, in the Giles catalog published in the 1957. Uh, so basically, they all have a Stein number sitting between somewhere um, Stein 1 to Stein 6. Thousand uh, nine hundred oh, sixty nine eighty, <laughs> um, right. So, so um, we talked a lot about versions of the Lotus Sutra in Chinese. Um, so it is no surprise that most of the items on the project are Kurama Jiva's, um version of the Lotus Sutra. So the, here's an example. Um, but then we also had a lot of interest on Dharmaraksha's version of the Lotus Sutra and uh, on the project we have two. Uh, one was mentioned this morning. Um, so, um, so, yeah, this one is chapter 22 to 24 of the Lotus Sutra in Chinese and when I first saw the image I was very... Um, surprised because the calligraphy just came from an earlier time and then I checked the Giles catalog he thinks is from fifth century um, and was very interesting as a title I <laughs> am not an expert on this but um, yeah um, so this is one of the items uh, by Damarak uh, of the uh, Damarak Rakshas version of the Lotus Sutra and then this and this is the second uh, piece on the project, uh, that is Zhong Fa Hua Jing. Um, I was, um, because the calligraphy are quite similar to some of the other uh, Lotus Sutra items from town, uh, I was quite surprised to find this one um, that's actually not uh, the Kumarajiva's version. Um, so yeah, you, you have also mentioned your presentation and I think it must have something to do with the circulation of the text in, uh, at the same time, um, which is very interesting. Um, so we also have items that are Lotus Sutra, but there are other texts written on it, and this is a example on the project, and you may have seen on our project page, uh, which is uh, Stein 155. So it's, uh, I think it's uh, chapter 25, Pumen Pin, and then uh, it's about two meters long, and on the verso, it has is filled with Tibetan divination text. Um, and then this is an example melody mentioned in her presentation that is Lotus Sutra and Heart Sutra written in one scroll. Um, this might have something to do with how they were practicing the religion uh, back then. And also this one. Um, so it's Lotus Sutra, and then I think it's possibly two scrolls, but connected together. <laughs> I've uh, not had time to put more detail on this. Um, so this is only a few examples from the projects that we digitized. Um, there are many more that's worthy of a feature, but in the interest of time, um, and it's, there are just too many of them I cannot fit in my presentation. Um, so, so, um, so that was the, the few pictures I showed you. That was in terms of the content scope. Um, for the purpose of creating digital surrogates from the analog item, um, it is no doubt the physical property of the items constitute a very important scope for the project. And careful analysis of them will help us clarify our work and enable us to plan efficiently. <coughs> So I'm just going to use some examples to show you the um, range of um, um, items that we deal with um, on the project. So the project um, fin um, included short fragments 
uh, as small as this. I think this is probably a little bit over 10 centimeters. And there's only untitled life left. Um, and then, I don't know if this is, okay. So this one is the longest, uh, one of the longest growths on the project, which is 13 meters. I hope this works. <laughs> it takes some time to show. <laughs> yeah. Thirteen one three meters. Yeah. Okay, still going. Does this count as one recital? <laughs> right, so I still have the uh, roller left, uh, which is quite rare. Uh, and um, yeah, but it's already detached from the items, but we tried to place it next to the item to show the relation. Um, so this is sign number 3671, 3671. Um, and then the average length. And we have quite a lot of long scrolls like this, not as long as 13 meters, but maybe from 8 meters, 9 meters, 10 meters, um, which is which really interesting challenges for digitization um, and conservation as well. Um, and the average length of the item on the project is about four to five meters. And the height range mostly uh, maybe 13, 13 centimeters to 32 centimeters, um, not including the booklets. Uh, so yeah, so we also have three booklets on the project. Um, they probably have all appeared in previous presentations. Um, so yeah, we have I don't know if this is this the pointer. Okay, so this one was a image uh, shot by our photographer Isabel. Uh, so I think it's wrapped in the conservation, the paper that our conservators um, added, and then there's a color form at the end. Um, and in the booklet, we also found this little flap. Um, that we don't know what it is, but we digitized treating it as a single folio. So we digitized um, the rectal side and <laughs> verso of both flaps. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I didn't press. So it's here. And if you have followed our IDP Twitter, uh, you might have seen a GIF that we, um, where the flap was moving. Um. So this is um, because Professor Moretti has mentioned uh, the sutra with smaller text, and this is one of the example. And this is also the long, one of the longest, the second longest item on the project. Um, so I'm not gonna <laughs> show the host grow again. But uh, apparently, it, I think, um, I've not verified it, but it seems that it tries to fit in one chapter within one panel. Um, um, OK. So um, Professor Stephen Tizer uh, yesterday showed the item uh, 218, Stein 2181. Uh, so this is another item, which is uh, Stein number 4209. So it's probably the same group of manuscripts copied by, uh, written in the imperial court. Um, and is the colophon shows the date, Xianhong uh, Xianhong San Nian Si Yue Shu Ri, and that is um, year 672, May the 14th. Um, and it was copied by Zhao Wenshen from the Mengxiaxiong, which is royal chancellery. And it used 19 pieces of little hand paper, and it was mounted by Jie Shanji. Uh, and then it was first proofread by this, uh, there are like first proofreader, second proofreader, third proofreader, 
and then there are four close readers, and uh, there are secretary and director of the project. So uh, yes, yeah, Professor mentioned there are a lot of scholarship around this already. Um, so it's very exciting to have included one of this item in the project. We have a few more other items uh, like this. Um, but uh, putting my project manager hat on, I, <laughs> I, I was very excited because this is just like a workflow to me and um, from Town Dynasty. So I find great resonance in our work. Um, so I'm going to show you some workflow chart. Um, so bear with me, this chart read from right to left uh, because after seeing the town flow chart, I have a preference to in regards to the direction of the flow chart. <laughs> so the, our project, there are several stages to the project. Um, so when we say the start of the project is really the delivery stage. Uh, so we started conserve, conserving and started imaging slowly in the summer of 2017. And then before that, there were six months of condition checking that was led by Melody Dumi uh, and supported by a few other conservators um, at the BLCC. Um, so after, so the con condition assessment will assess the suitability of the item for digitization. Um, if they are suitable, then they could go directly to digitization. Uh, if they need some treatment, then they will go via conservation. Um, and then after digitization, they will be uploaded to the website. Uh, but before that, we have a quality control process, which I'm going to mention later. Um, so yeah, this is a very simple um, outline of our workflow. And there's a second chart, which is a bit more complex, uh, but it's still a very high level abstraction of the work we do. Um, so yeah, like, so actually all the <laughs> major work are represented by the blue squares and um, they are very complicated, which my colleagues will show you in the following presentation. Um, so the um, assessment um, done in the uh, condition checking um, served as really a foundation of how we planned our work. Um, it will offer an estimation of uh, the item, uh, the ti conservation time required. Um, and also, um, Melody also um, logged the metadata of the item, um, for example, lens height. Um, so what is, it was, um, I think the pr previous curators have done the measurement, but it's never, you know, it, it can always be double checked. And so we were really working with fresh uh, measurement, uh, but it's still like approximate number that, um, that uh, we, we base our work on. Um, okay. Um, so I'm going to introduce a bit more details in my next slides. So I'm not going to spend too much time on here, but just to <laughs> show you the flowchart <laughs> of our work. Okay. Um, so one of the really interesting um, character of the project is the extent of conservation work required. So. Although our name uh, on the project page is Lotus Sutra Manuscripts Digitization Project, but it is very much a conservation project. Um, and it is well known that a lot of the Donghua manuscripts are very fragile. And uh, I found this example, which is an uh, item included on our project. On the back, it was, uh, there's a note written by uh, Stein's secretary, Jiang Xiaowan, uh, based, and he just wrote, Po lan bu kan jing yi do yi kun. So uh, a bundle of some very torn uh, sutras. <laughs> and um, um, so this really show in our project um, that uh, based on the uh, initial condition checking that was systematically done, um, they are, um, we came, they are about 
800, uh, 689 items requires conservation. So that's 87% of the items on the project. Um, and half of them uh, requires around three to five hours, may maybe some light uh, treatment. But uh, what's significant is uh, this from here to here. Um, and another half requires 10 to 25 plus hours of conservation work. And this plus uh, is uh, uncertainty to us. Uh, and it turned out that several items on the project uh, required more than 100 hours of conservation work. So this is quite unusual if you're just looking at it from a digitization project because um, um, you know the time is organized around digitization, which is very fast paced. Um, however, those most damaged scrolls are normally um, they are very tricky to fit in a fast paced digitization schedule. However, they are really in most need of care and requires significant expertise um, for treatment. And we kept this in mind in our work. Uh, throughout the project, we tried to strike a very fine balance between maintaining a smooth workflow with the rest of the work packages, uh, while making sure that those most damaged items can be conserved in, within our schedule for long-term preservation. Uh, and I believe my colleagues uh, will go into that uh, in more details. And on top of keeping up with conservation schedule, uh, we, our conservators have also tried to build systems for more precise future estimates and have optimized the workflow within conservation. Um, this will be invaluable for planning and assessing the future conservation and digitization work in the wider Stein collection. So this is really just an outline. Um, and this is our conservator, uh, Marie Kaloju, Maria Muzat, uh, Paulina Kraka, and Tania Estrada. Um, so uh, unfortunately, Marie, uh, who has been with us from the start of the project, who participated in the condition assessment, uh, she is unable to join us today due to an unexpected reason. Um, and this is her that's giving, uh, introducing our work to uh, a delegation from the Dunhuang Academy. And Maria is, um, I think it's dying, experimenting dying paper. And Paulina is uh, encapsulating a fragment within the Melinex. Um, and Tanya is treating a scroll. OK, for digitization. Um, so uh, this comes to another point about the project that I find very interesting um, is that from a digitization project perspective, um, it is very unusual that our photographers will need to carry out a, um, a significant amount of post-processing. Uh, that's because the item format um, and in order to represent um, the scroll format, uh, we have to stitch individual images together. Um, so this is a very unique in the British Library context. So the IDP has been very experienced in doing this for years. Um, but um, the British Library, um, although there are a huge variety of items, but the most common items are books. Um, so when other project managers are managing the productivity around folio numbers. I'm talking about length. So we use length as a measure to plan and uh, monitoring our work. Um, so at the end of the project, we produced over 17,000 high-rise images. So we take rectal and versal panel images and then stitch them together. So this is including the stitched long scroll image. And since we image both sides of the scroll, uh, the total digitized length of item is um, eight kilometers. OK, 
Okay, so uh, very, I have only five minutes. I'm going to do the rest very quickly. So web delivery, uh, I mentioned that we have a rigorous quality checking process um, before uh, uploading images online. And thanks to the collaboration with the British Library's Heritage Made Digital Program, we have a dedicated digitization pro uh, officer uh, for this project, uh, working part-time each week, check, and we checked all images uh, on the project. Um, so instead of only doing a percentage of it, which is not uncommon for mass digitization project. Um, so this is a wonderful blog written by Francisco Perez Garcia, um, who is the digitization officer working on the project. Um, so um, I showed in the flowchart that there are some components that that go beyond the project, and one is enhanced cataloging. Um, so throughout the project, I believe we enhanced the description of the items uh, around maybe 87 items that was um, more detailed, in, de described in a more detailed way, and that was done by Melody Dumi and Talin Xie, curators of the Chinese collections. Um, so this is pretty much ongoing work, uh, and curators are doing this on top of their uh, other commitments um, to the collection. Um, and uh, so this is an example of the, so this is the kind of description um, for the item I just showed, the Zheng Fa Hua Jing. Um, and we will ingest the, this information on the 4D database for the IDP website. However, I think now, uh, as it stands now, the website cannot show, but hopefully in the updated website in March, it will show the, this information. Um, but throughout the, uh, but we, we um, uploaded about 10 items onto Wikimedia Commons, so you can actually see the images and uh, see the descriptions here. And I think it's also bilingual because we had an intern um, translating it, um, sitting in the um, who, who was sitting with the digital scholarship team. Um, um, so in the climate of fast uh, and exciting development in the in the digital scholarship, um, we have also tried to. Uh, expand into the area um, throughout the project. And one of the initiatives uh, was uh, Chevening Fellowship on the um, handwritten text recognition technology um, led by my colleague Adi from the digital, uh, who is the digital curator of the Asian and African collections. Um, so the Chevening Fellowship is sponsored by the UK government, and we hope to um, have a scholar, res digital researcher, or professionals uh, coming from the mainland China to explore using HTR technology onto our manuscripts. Um, however, we um, oh sorry, I noticed this <laughs> typo <typhoon> here. <laughs> Um, and we try to, <laughs> um, yeah, um, sorry. <laughs> uh, so we have put out this call, uh, I don't remember when, 2019, I think initially, and it overlapped nicely with the pandemic. So we had two candidates. Uh, we, so the call was uh, published twice, and we had really ideal candidates, but because of the pan pandemic, they could not come. Um, which is a great shame uh, to us. Um, however, in the past few weeks, um, because the project has concluded, uh, we had some capacity to do some text run of um, um, HTR with our images. Uh, and one of this, this is the work in progress, um, training HTR segmentation model via a open source uh, platform called eScriptorium, uh, which is a UI um, designed for uh, Kraken, which is an OCR system, um, 
and now I'm collaborating with Colin Brisson based in Paris. Um, so this is, we only started this work maybe two weeks ago and uh, was involved with to, uh, we use our digitized image and um, we crop them to the um, required specs. I manually uh, labeled around um, 30 minute uh, images. In the beginning, the model uh, sort of didn't consistently work with our manuscripts, but this is after 30 images, uh, we already can, so this is a segmentation model that we can see that it recognized um, the, the text area in the manuscripts. Uh, yeah, even there are holes and missing characters, so yeah, which is quite promising. And hopefully we will do um, deepen this work in the next few weeks or we're leading to next year. Okay. So, right, so this comes to the end of uh, my presentation. I hope I gave you an overview of the work um, we tried to do. And last but not the least, I want to thank uh, everyone on the Lotus Sutra team. It's been wonderful um, that we worked together in the past five years and also the Asian African collections. Um, and yes, so this is uh, my thanks list and uh, is, I tried to mention everyone and you can also see that how many people are involved in a digitization project like ours. Um, and also uh, my sincere thanks to the Beijing Town Foundation who made our work possible. Great, thank you. Thank you.